We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. So tonight, I've got some questions for Sean, who recently finished reading through Pandora Total Destruction. Um, based on the Kickstarter, it was described as a tabletop role-playing game where players take on the role of overpowered supers trying to overcome a great evil. So let's start off with the basics. What is Pandora Total Destruction? Pandora Total Destruction was created, designed, written, and laid out by Todd Crapper. Development and safety editor was Kate Bullock. Editor was Vincent Harper. And illustrations are by Titi and I really apologize for that pronunciation on that last name. I'm really not 100% sure on that one. Now, the content is decided is intended for two to five players ages 14 and plus and does require a D6, D8, D10, and D12. Yeah. Now, I backed this project on Kickstarter myself at a digital level, but Todd was generous enough to provide us with a physical copy for review, and we do thank him for that. Thanks, While Todd. I while I haven't yet had the time or group to play this system, I have done a thorough read through and not just in a parking lot. <laughs> the premium color soft cover plus digital has an MSRP on drive through RPG of $53 or $31 for the, for the black and white soft cover. Okay. Before we get started, I do think a bit of disclosure is in order here. So besides the fact that Todd comped us a copy of the physical book, I also know Todd personally, having gamed with him and under him at small handful of game conventions, as well as interacting online before and after that. I also know Kate pretty well, and I wouldn't be surprised if I've interacted with Vincent and Tithi at some point in the past as well. These are people I consider friends. Heck, even one of our Patreon patrons, Danielle, was part of an actual play pod play test video, which was run by Todd himself that you can watch on YouTube and was featured during the Kickstarter. Now, I don't think this has or will impact our opinions on Pandora, but I wanted to make sure we at least got that out there. Absolutely. And while I follow Kate and Todd and I've met them both, I don't have the same sort of personal relationship that with them that Mo does. So it's even easier for me to be unbiased in my review. All right, now that that's over, now that we know where it came from, how much it costs, what are you actually getting for that money? Well, when you get the physical book, you're getting 155 pages plus handouts and character sheets. And this includes a table of contents, a glossary, and an index. Though the index is before the appendixes and handouts, so it takes a bit of flipping. We're using a sticky note as a page stopper okay. to find it. Now, the book itself is sized at 7 inch by 10 inch, which is normal a normal enough trim size, though not as common, I find, for RPGs. How about quality? So the book is a print-on-demand from DriveThruRPG. And while the content sometimes disappoints from, RP <laughs> from DriveThruRPG, I have <laughs> yet to ever have any complaint about the quality of printing I have received from them. This is a <laughs> per-bound soft cover with full bleed graphics and a generally solid layout. If I had to complain about anything, it's that the text creeps a bit close to the gutter for this type of binding and leads to cracking the binding more than many purists like to do. But it's not something that personally bothers me. I crack away. All right, enough boring stuff. Let's talk about the game, starting with the premise. Now, I know this is a supers game, but Todd calls it an overpowered supers game and specifically calls out you're fighting a great evil. So this isn't your standard super street level up to cosmic level role-playing game is it no no so this is a game that is about struggle oppression discrimination racism touching on some dark themes as well as being a very lightly veiled story about some real world horrors that have played out around us actually in particular in canada mm -hmm. this is a game about a world where superpowers have existed for decades emerging from the beginnings of the nuclear age they flourished until one event showed the world the potential they had for chaos. And the world reacted, or as some might say, overreacted. What came next was a UN organization of 164 countries that mandated training for all empowered people. The Pandora Initiative. They instituted secure Pandora academies across the world. It's explained to the population of normals, referred to as nethers in the book, okay. that it is a way to ensure the safety of all, for the greater good, if you will, mirroring in many ways the residential school system here in Canada. 
I hope we can all see even now the dark path that this game can take. So somewhat like the plot of Civil War from Marvel, right? Though more the comic version of the story arc, not the, the, the MCU version. Uh, to agree, though, there really isn't anyone on the side of the government here. Oh, okay. Uh, this is more of an X-Men government ver uh, versus the mutants, governments versus the mutants, discrimination, hatred bred from a fear of people who are different from us. Okay, so a significant difference. So you're, you're not going to play with the Iron Man side of the conflict on this time and the lawful versus the chaotic. This is definitely the oppressor versus the oppressed instead. Right, yes. So this game is written in a manner that is unique to me, at least in RPGs. Todd has used blank, graphic-free pages to represent the story, the in-character fiction, about the world around the, uh, the players. Uh, for the GM or moderator in this game to use or read out. Okay. It is stark, but so is the world it's representing. And in that way, it's effective, not only in its mm -hmm. ease of separating the game text from the world text, but also in allowing the reader to focus on what are, at times, some rather chilling words. Okay. Now, further on, he then goes to use the logo for the United Empowered Organization as the box text callout. Uh, and box text is used as the core rules reference for the players to <laughs> easily reference in the game. So, wait, the rules are in the box text and the boxed read aloud stuff isn't in boxes. Just kind of a weird choice. It's like Todd was trying to actually go against the norm. They're like, ah, screw you old D&D modules. I'm going to do it my own way. Is that, I, I have to assume that was done on purpose. I think you could probably say that and Todd might be able to enlighten us about his feelings here. But honestly, for this game, at least, it just works. Okay. Uh, the moderator can focus on the blank pages for world building and a quick flip to a section lets you glance at the available box to get the rules you're looking for really easily. Okay. So supers are oppressed in this setting, which really isn't anything new. Like I said, look at X-Men, right? But I know Todd, and I'm pretty sure he would have taken these themes and really blew them up. And you already mentioned this a bit, but like, these are some pretty heavy things, and I'm assuming they're probably taken to extremes to make a point. Absolutely. Uh, this is, while not hopeless, pretty close. Uh, you're trapped against your will in a government-run school, <laughs> on top of which you are dangerous. Okay. You have done bad things and possibly hurt people. Mm. Question number two in character creation is, what terrible thing has the character done because of their power? Yeah, right there. The number two question in generation. So while not required, this has the ability to go very dark with the right group. Or the wrong group is what I'd worry about. So with all this heavy content and the fact Kat, Kate was involved, I have to assume there's plenty of tools given to make sure it doesn't go the wrong way, that the game doesn't get taken too far or, and to prevent players abusing uh, a, a system and setting that I think could probably pretty easily been uh, taken abuse in a way like like edge lorded or 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 run for tourism's sake, which I don't think is the intention of the game. No, and they did a great job with this. And uh, to be fair, I can't say I'm surprised. Kate has a rich history in safety. And it shows in this game, which, as you pointed out, has a real potential to go dark places. There is an entire chapter dedicated to the safety process, and it provides resources and guides to everyone through the processes. I have okay. to say that some, as someone who already does implement safety tools at my tables, I still learned new tips reading through this. All right, cool. So we did get a comment back from Todd, who is awesome here. So for those of you listening, you can't see this, but Todd actually joined us here for our live recording. So we're getting some live feedback right from the designers, which is fantastic. So Todd says, the concept is that the no art pages are from an actual book written by a reporter. And the UEO logo shows official documents, which are the documents that teach you how to play the game. It's as if, as this, if the uh, game was leaked. That's right. We're leaked from a secret UEO lab. All right, besides being repressed and playing basically the other, what more can you tell us about the people you'll be playing in Pandora? So players will be taking on the roles of what are called level 13 empowered people. That okay. is the highest and most dangerous level of empowered people, making up less than a single percent of all the empowered. Players are the students at a Pandora Academy, 
which can vary from a school-like environment, you know, think think of Professor X's, you know, mm -hmm. to an outright lockdown prison. Uh, you are in training, mandatory government-organized training, trying to gain control over your abilities. But in doing so, you are also dealing with discrimination coming at you from all sides. I really like the concept that the academy can vary from game to game. It's it's much more interesting than, yes, you're at Xavier School or you're part of the Abarla Academy or you're all prisoner. I like that there's the variety available there. That's cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is a narrative game. And the goal is to tell an interesting and provocative story. Okay. Now, while it is technically possible to gain control of your powers and end up with a happy ending of graduation, it is at the expense of a good story that you would do so, uh, at least in one adventure arc, uh, you would need to sp follow a very specific path. So the one thing I'm, I'm getting a lot of vibes of CO2 here. So CO2 second edition um, from Vitalis Serta very much to me felt more of a statement than a game. And obviously Todd is trying to make a point here and provide some social commentary, which I think is fantastic. It's great. It's a great use of this medium to hopefully open some people's eyes. But does this come at the expense of playing a game? Not to question Todd's designer chops or anything, but like as a Supers RPG fan, does it sound like playing Pandora would be enjoyable? So this is obviously going to vary group by group. But if you'd asked me if I would enjoy playing Teen Supers getting in touch with their emotions a decade ago, I would have <laughs> laughed at you. And okay. this is an experience much like that, in that it forces you to deal with topics you may have never had to face head on. As a, you know, old cis white male, a game like this may be the only opportunity I or others like me have to even begin to understand the sort of discrimination that others can feel on a regular basis and the, and the type of struggles that have happened in the real world to people around us just under the guise of Empowered. All right, fair. So we talked about the roles. Let's move on to the game part, right? It's a role-playing game. You mentioned this is a narrative RPG. How, how much of a hippie story game is this? Does it have a traditional GM role? What goes into making characters and what kind of mechanics are we looking at? So the GM does exist, though not in a D&D &D form. Okay. They're there to guide and help call out the mechanical triggers in the narrative, but not shape the experiences as a GM running from a book or who has come up with this grand plan uh, that they want to guide the characters through. Right. right. So character creation is primarily question driven with different dice from D6 to D12 representing different levels of your three ability scores, which are conflict, interaction, and protection. So those are the three things that you're going to be rolling uh, when it's appropriate in the narrative, uh, when there is a conflict, when you are interacting with something okay. or something around you, and then protection uh, of someone or something. Now, additionally, the character has three values which are vital to their concept. That's where we get into the kind of the hippie, <laughs> the hippie Great. aspect of the character, I guess. And so you get one each of a heroic value, troublesome value, and a psychological value. Okay. Now these get points both at the start and throughout the game. But we'll address on value points a little later. But the character sheet is just a single page. Uh, the second page uh, is a turn reference, which is just a help, help helpful way to figure out, you know, what all the numbers and everything mean, and we'll probably get tossed away after the first couple of sessions for most players. Okay, fair enough. So after character creation, the team goes on to answer more questions, and this is the really sort of fun part, and you're building the academy at which right. everyone is housed. Uh, and this is tracked on, tracked on a separate academy character sheet by the moderator. Uh, overall, there are a notable number of moderator sheets available for managing your games. I really want to thank Todd for giving this sort of wealth of paperwork available uh, to players and GMs. Yeah, I was wondering if the Academy was going to be something the group created together. I, I guessed I knew the answer, but it's good to hear this group because because group word building is now something, honestly, again, to go with the fact that I want conflict resolution and not combat resolution. It's something I now expect from modern role playing games, especially narrative narrative games. And I'm not shocked at all and very happy to see it here. So. The game structure is broken into acts and scenes, with each complete story taking on a three-act form 
with optional prologue and epilogue that are purely narrative and not mechanical whatsoever. Okay. So act one is where characters ask questions, explore their academy and sort of find, help develop and figure out both the world around them, but also themselves and their interaction with each other. Uh, then now, I assume this is not like happy, shiny, let's go check out this room type <laughs> of explore the academy. Well, I mean, there's there there's, could be some of that, but then there are also uh, danger room training rooms in there and things where they can truly be tested. Uh, and they may walk into things they don't necessarily want to see or shouldn't see. Fair. Uh, act two, they start finding some answers and begin to start connecting some threads. Uh, you know, quiz, you know, hey, why does that strange thing always happen at that time? Or who is this strange person speaking in all the time? You know, things you, okay. you start to discover part of that misery. And then act three is where things come to a head. Uh, you get the revelations, the monologues, and most importantly, the final battle yeah. so scenes within acts are driven by points uh they're moments in time that have a goal associated with them okay at the beginning of each act all the players including the moderator roll for a number of scene points uh and can to redistribute them among the group so you know if, if one person rolled a one and somebody rolled a six you can you can give up some of your scene points to to, to balance out the number of story beats that uh, you're looking for. Okay. Uh, and then there's a, a cost structure that I'm not gonna go into all the details and charts, but there's a cost structure to generating scenes. Uh, and you use your points for scenes. You can, and the, the GM, the moderator can use their points to help the villain take focus in a scene. So you, the villain okay. can have sort of a, a big scene to, to reveal some stuff if they wanna spend their points that way. So, uh, if the moderator, if the, if the scene has run down, so if, the, if you're out of, uh, out of action rules and the players have not achieved their goals, they do not get the benefit of revisions. It's almost like failing an adventure sort of thing. Okay. Uh, now types of scenes include spotlight scenes, which are your generic sort of, that would be the basic scene. Mm -hmm. uh, your battle scenes, and these are the big ones that happen sort of at the end of the acts, so the big, big moments uh, where, not only are your players in danger, but so are people in the real world. Uh, battle scenes come with costs. Uh, training scenes, where you can do pretty much anything you want. Uh, if you wanted to go back in time in the danger room and, and fight, you know, <laughs> Nazis, go ahead. Um, the training scenes allow you to explore and work on developing the control of your power, which is, a, again, the point of the Pandora Academies is to train and empower people. And then finally, there are vital scenes, which are a spotlight scene taken down to a narrow focus. Um, okay. So you're, you're spending extra points to, to very narrow in on a specific character and a specific aspect. Again, varying costs and outcomes and goals spread out among these types. And there are a couple of charts that sort of help, help players understand all that if you are sitting down and playing the game. Yeah, that's that's quite a bit to wrap your head around. And I got to say, a, a highly detailed, almost scripted structure, play structure, uh, doesn't surprise me at all from Todd. Um, High Plane Samurai, one of his previous games that I personally really enjoy, had a very unique structure to its play that I admit when Todd was teaching the game with his little PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> um, sounded limiting at first, but actually ended up playing great at the table. And I got to admit, at this point, it's not really clear to me I like trying to envision this in my head, how the three eye structure works and how the points work and scenes and all that. But like you're spending points to, to accomplish things or are these points goals? Like uh, you said, you're, scenes so you're are setting up by your points. points you're, set, you're spending your points to set up the scenes. So I want to do okay. a scene about me exploring this. And someone else says, oh, well, while we're doing that, I would like to include this in the scene. And I'm going to spend a little bit so that our scene includes this. and you so know, it's narrative currency. Right, exactly. So okay. it's, it's, setting up, it's setting up the narrative the, the, the narrative for that scene by spending some of your available scene points. All right, at this point, not having read it myself, I'm just going to trust that it works. Yeah, so I think mechanically, this may be the hardest aspect of the game to wrap one's head around. Uh, again, the scene points are spent using charts provided in the book, some scenes happening at specific trigger points, uh, like again, a battle occurs when all the ever when everyone's points are spent and accounted for at the, the end you get to the end of the act and that's where you get a battle okay 
uh, and then again, the moderator has points to spend, which is a strange sort of thing. You don't normally think of, uh, in a narrative game like this, the, the, the GM having the ability to say, oh, I'm making my own scene today. <laughs> although, although to be honest, I, I first saw that in a super game, which was the um, Marvel heroic role playing from Cortex or Margaret Weiss, uh, Margaret Weiss Productions, MWP, where they had the, the they called it like the threat pool. And every time things escalated and bad things happened, the DM got more dice and they could spend them then to make horrible things happen, including if they managed to get up to 2D12, they could just end the scene right in a bad way. So there is some precedent there, even with supers games. Fair. And so just to get things even more complicated, and I'm not going to delve into it, there are steps in each scene. And the okay. number of steps is actually how long a scene is, uh, and a, a step is an action roll. So if a scene is six steps long, you only get six action rolls, and it's over. Um, now, of course, an action roll isn't the same as narrative. You can have a lot of things happening that just On don't trigger an action roll or, or that are triggered by a single action roll. Yeah, that, that again reminds me a bit of High Plane Samurai. But yeah, at this point, I think I'm going to have to read it myself, try playing the game or watch an actual play to really grok all this. But like I said, I, it sounds like it works. Luckily, we even know someone who's in one of the actual plays. <laughs> there you go. Now, like mo most modern narrative games, this is not something where you sit down and play through an adventure designed by someone else. <laughs> even yeah. the moderator should have limited plans going in. Much of the adventure is players sitting around talking as if they were workshopping a fictional novel. And the moderator is there to participate, but most importantly, to catch when the narrative narrative triggers the mechanics. So that right, point so at where, okay, we're at an, a we're at a point here that's interesting. Let's do something about it. Yeah, so a writer's room style RPG, uh, like we were joking earlier, modern modern hippie game, uh, versus a traditional petition the GM style system. And, and Todd says right there in the chat room, there is a lot of High Plane Samurai in Pandora. <laughs> yeah, so catching those trigger points is just so important because each roll will advance that scene one step closer to its end. Uh, and so whenever things can be interesting due to the outcome of randomness or when powers are in use, that's when the, G the GM moderator is going to step in and say, okay. okay, I think we should have a role here. Uh, powers being a big one again. Powers are a, a vital part of this. Um, and although I don't think we, I, I mentioned it before, uh, there is no you know chart of powers or roll on this type of power. No, you oh, just pick yeah, your powers. Question. This is just, you get a power. You're, you're going to have a power that sort of establishes who you are. Um, and I mean, I mean, it could be a, a, it depends on how you want to define it. But general, I, I would generally push players uh, for my reading to go with something rather general. Uh, I turn into a kaiju. Um, I control flame. Um, and okay. then you, from the narrative, build out more about that power as you go. All right. So so when one of these these triggers happen or when one of power is used, uh, what are the mechanics here? So you've described the intent either in the narrative already or the GM asks you to you know clarify and, and specify mm -hmm. the intent. Um, then we set the target number. The base number is a six. And then it's modified by uh, complications or other, yeah. you know, bennies, you know, value points are, are the bennies in this game. Um, uh, complications are part of the scene that make the action more difficult, whether it's slippery terrain, uh, a hail of bullets for shooting at you, a yeah, crowd of civilians nearby, stuff. you know, usual stuff. Yep, yep. Uh, and then you roll the applicable die, and there may be an extra die, either a power or an overpower die, roll depending on various factors okay so are you adding those or are you trying to you're best of them so you're adding. okay uh if while using a power you roll over the target number uh, it is only if uh, while using a power uh you roll over the target number you create havoc and there's a chart for that on the uh, on your reference page to determine the outcome of the roll but in short under the target number fails matching the target number is a perfect success okay and over the target number is a success with havoc being caused. So you may not want those extra dice. I'm assuming they're not optional? Correct. Okay. So havoc, that sounds fascinating. So so is this a resource? Like you've gotten over, you've, you've gone beyond what you needed to do what you were gonna do and you've caused havoc, which I gotta say, talk about tying the theme to the mechanics right there. That's fantastic. 
uh, is Havoc like a resource you can use to ensure success? Like, are you like, I'm going to spend Havoc or is it just something you earn and you may or may not want? So uh, Havoc gives you two things, really. Uh, first off, you get value points. And again, as we talked about, these are bennies and you can use, you, you sort of, you add those okay. to your, uh, to your values and can be spent in, in various ways, sort of like a Benny or a fate point. But Havoc is an interesting con, uh, concept in the game as it is both unwanted and beneficial at the same time. Okay. So as a student trying to gain control of your power, again, you are, that's why you're in the, uh, you're in the school. You don't want to knock down a building or flatten oh, a landmark huh. or, you know, blow up the Dean's car. And yet right. you learn about things about yourself when these things do happen. Assuming okay. you manage to stay conscious. <laughs> Interesting. So additionally, players can choose to succeed or choose to fail, hmm. uh, though there are mechanical repercussions for such choices. Uh, but for instance, you might not want to cause the havoc indicated by your successful role and choose to fail. Uh, and in doing so, you gain a complication that's going to affect things later on moving on. Sounds kind of cool. I, again, the theme seems to tie in really well. Oh, I got to say this particular choosing to fail is just such a hard concept for some traditional role playing game players to grasp. There are way too many gamers out there, still out there in today's world, that are scared to fail. And I worry that could be a deal breaker right there. Yeah, no, it's, and unfortunately, there's no real way, easy way around that. That's just, yeah. uh, you know, failing is good. And, and as soon as people understand that failing can be beneficial and we learn it's through more our failures, um, yes. it's, it's, you know, the, that's how the real world works. And uh, I guess some people just don't want any of the real world in their game. I, I don't I, know. To, to be fair, I don't blame them sometimes. So fair enough. So uh, unlike many narrative games, this game can kill characters. Now, again, as mentioned, this is a dark reality. Uh, players can receive harm. Uh, and this is, hap this is something that happens through, uh, through Havoc. Uh, they can develop manifestations of their powers, which are sort of sort of extra things that happen or or can be done with powers and uh uh and then they can gain the value points which are the, that benny or fate point available for use in the game uh similarly to uh the value that the players get the moderator can choose if everyone agrees to get thwart points which are okay. sort of the the gm's benny now Todd's going to me mentions here in the in the chat room he's absolutely correct and I haven't I haven't called this out enough. Uh it's all about player agency. Uh and that's why this havoc is given to the player to spend. So you do okay. you you gain 3 havoc and you choose what damage is done if and and whether you you, you can choose to hurt yourself rather than hurting the pedestrians or you know okay. uh, you can choose to hurt the pedestrians instead of hurting yourself. It's it's up to you what is being done it's not up to the dm what that happens when your powers go awry um and again yes absolutely todd the player agency is a massive aspect of of that havoc and and, and uh choosing to fail uh, or cho choosing to succeed uh features of the game oh sounds good and i also dig the fact there's resource management on i'm, I'm going to use the term screen but both sides of the the screen right yep. something i dig but again traditional players don't like those dm intrusions no matter how many big popular monty cook games get released <laughs> it just doesn't seem to be a popular uh, uh mechanic in too many old school players fair enough though i have to say unlike many pbta games the GM does get to roll dice in this, which okay. I know is a bit of a relief to some GMs, myself definitely included. It's one of those <laughs> things that that I, I cringe while I'm playing masks because it just not rolling dice seems wrong. Uh, and I, yeah. I I still struggle with that. Fair. I, I had the <laughs> same problem trying to run Numenera. So. Yeah. so as well as all the mechanics and guides on how to play, the book features rich detail guides and charts to help you as a moderator bring your stories to life and to understand the world of pandora academies as intended by the author all right speaking of intended by the author right um i think most listeners know this you definitely know it you know how that i think every role-playing game should have a sample adventure right i realize it's not as applicable to most narrative games but like something in the back of the book 
that shows you how the designer wanted you to play the game. Now, you mentioned the game isn't really designed for pre-created stories, but is there something like a sample academy or a sample setting or a sample big bad, like something to at least get you the idea of what you can do with the system? So the answer is yes and no. Uh, so the, while there is a chart that helps give ideas about some plot directions uh, okay. based on the answers given during the academy creation, and it's fantastic. It's, it's a really detailed full page for every question. Okay. Um, there are some sample academy staff and okay. there are, uh, some villains pre-gen, you know, sort of sample villains, but there are no pre-gen characters or pre-gen pre-built academies. Uh, okay. and I think that's good. <laughs> um, this game is made by its group contributions and perhaps its greatest weakness is a hesitant player, not willing to take part can lessen that experience yeah. for everyone. Uh, and that's something that I feel like, you know, handing out a, a fully flushed out uh, or at least statted character to someone would enable. Right. Um, I feel this game more than many that I have tried doesn't or won't deal well with the one player who just kind of sits in the corner, but is handy in combat. Mm. Uh, now, Todd may have tips and tricks to help with that sort of player as, as you know, someone who's more familiar with this specific style of game. But I know for me, I would feel they would really bring down the sessions and, and I would struggle to have them uh, as part of the, the table. So my, my one concern here is playing with Deanna. Deanna does not like shared world building. She wants to sit down and be presented a story to react to. Now, character creation is different, right? You're answering questions for the character. I do worry a bit that this might rely a bit too much on it. Like a quiet, she would be that quiet character in the corner, not wanting to throw in new narrative objects. So I, I, I do have a feeling that's going to limit the audience of this game somewhat. Uh, perhaps. Um, although at the same time, uh, if they are willing to be involved in the character creation, that's a great start. And if you right. can keep that momentum into the academy creation, you get the buy-in for both themselves and the world right there. Because okay. it's not as much as creating an entire, <laughs> uh, it's not as much about creating an entire city or, you know, you, there isn't as much uh, out there to worry about because you can contain it inside the school but if you want. It sounds like the scene structure is even, I wanna have a scene about this. And, and there's definitely going to be for some players prompting from the, the moderator who, you know, right urges people to get in there uh without that you know if you if the moderator or gm isn't going to be able to do that there will be troubles absolutely right um i think uh while the book on its own is while maybe not suitable for a complete beginner it is okay. a very strong foundation for playing the game even as a newer gm uh the deep immersion in the theme and plentiful helpful tables suggestions and guides uh really make it pretty accessible for a wide range of groups, okay. not just those who've already played a thousand narrative story RPGs. Um, I would say that the dark content and importance of safety tools are actually more of a limiting factor than a lack of knowledge or experience in narrative gaming. Uh, though again, based on what we talked about tonight, it does sound like this could be some work for a traditional gamer to wrap their heads around. Um, especially some of the more story game elements here. Um, something that honestly, I think wouldn't burden someone who's new to the hobby because they wouldn't have those preconceived ideas, but could definitely be a barrier for older hands. Yeah, sadly, this is too often the case. And I've run into many tried players who've just hit a wall when trying to be involved yeah. in the narrative games. Um, yet thankfully I found others who embrace it. Uh, and I count myself as one of those converts. Uh, in this case, less experience in gaming, uh, trad gaming specifically, may be better than a lack of experience yeah. in just modern narrative. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So there's a great uh, thing here from Todd. So uh, controlling the environment and setting, which is, is sort of what, uh, what D might have, have problems with and, and struggle with is uh, that player agency. Uh, and the intent was Pandora to be available for anyone or groups who have been dealing with systemic or generational trauma, which is again, you know, as a, as an, as, as a, as a, 
uh, empowered player here you are at, at taking on that role um and uh that that player agency helps the gm not go somewhere that they don't that the, the players might not want to it's an ec extra layer of that safety okay. by having so much of it guided by the players as well as the gm all right so one of the things we haven't touched on we talked an awful lot about the overpowered supers part but the original elevator pitch for this game is a tabletop role-playing game where you take on the role of overpowered supers trying to overcome a great evil so what's with this great evil? Is it just the the oppression you mentioned earlier or something less ephemeral? Well, the final battle of the third act is designed to be that big bad villain fight. Okay. Though how that takes place or is represented is open to interpretation again by, by the table. Uh, and we are reminded that a villain doesn't necessarily equal evil. By encouraging okay. us to step back from simplistic tropes to embrace deeper ideas. Um, there is a plot that is developing across all three acts. There is a final battle, but it doesn't have to be a big monster or an ice shooting villain out to conquer the world. Could be the head of the Academy who's slowly been trying to uh, warm up empowered to become a force that will bring him to eventual power or, uh, you know, just crush the, the, the will of level 13 empowered at, at that specific Academy. Um, there's, there's a lot of different ways it can go and what that big evil is, is something that again, is developed through the play. So again, are, are there, there examples or prompts or guides to kind of help you determine this as a group? Uh, so again, that's all part of the question process in building that academy. Um, okay. So it's and, great and yeah, from you, the you can, you can develop out through that. All right. So every game ends in a big battle against some big bad. Got it. But that, is, that leads to one other question that I can't help thinking as you're going through all of this. Like, there's a lot of stuff, but this kind of sounds like like it's three acts, a big bad fight. Kind of sounds like a con game. Like, this isn't a single session system, is it? So I think you would be hard pressed to fit a session zero for character creation and academy creation and three acts into a single setting. Okay. Uh, at least not with any sort of meaningful play and discussion. <laughs> Uh, additionally, since it's highly likely anyone is going to gain full control of their powers and graduate from the Academy in a single three-act adventure, there's nothing stopping you from completing additional adventures, though you could just as easily, if, it, if everyone wanted to, start over and try a whole new Academy. All right, fair enough. It just kind of, I was getting that vibe. I'm like, I know it's a thicker book. It's probably not for single sessions, but I'm like, I've been to con games where I played a five-act structure, D&D &D, live <laughs> plays or five-act structure. So I was a little concerned that might be all we were getting here. No, nope. I think uh, I think there's definitely the potential to to really make this, um, you know, not only, not only one three-act over multiple sessions, but multiple three-act sessions into a sort of campaign until, you know, first one graduates or all your characters graduate and you start over, you start if one person graduates, they bring in a new character and they're the, they're the rookie on the, uh, at the school. Now I'm assuming this wouldn't have any kind of character progression XP system or anything like that. Uh, well, I mean, the thing that the, the, the progression is you're getting control. Uh, okay. you're, you're rolling closer to that six every time. Uh, you're not okay. rolling, you're not rolling a D 12 as an extra dice so that you there's no chance you're gonna you know uh hit or uh, uh hit your score you that's the the goal is to get get control of that power and graduate right. as a uh you know well educated and control under control empowered i gotta say there's definitely a dichotomy there of playing the most ostracized who have the most power that i find kind of fascinating all right what else we got so um <laughs> I mean, I, I don't really have that much for me at no. this point. And I, there's been some interesting, uh, interesting chats in there. I think while this game won't suddenly win over trad gamers to the narrative style, yeah. I think for anyone who enjoys a narrative superhero game and is looking for something that is both challenging in multiple ways, uh, you know, emotionally as well as as a as a game and new, this is a game you should get in your hands. Uh, if you're looking for something more golden age and uplifting, this yeah. probably isn't for you. Uh, you know, few students are going to graduate and even coming out unscathed at all will be a struggle. 
But for those who enjoy that struggle and that less pleasant reality of humanity, uh, the shared creation of stories and experiencing some of these hardships through the eyes of another, I think this game's a hit. Yeah, to me, this seems like a game for fans of a very distinct certain type of super story, right? Like X-Men, of course, comes to mind. That, that's that's the classic example of, of the oppressed mutants. Um, also, Runaways, um, one of my favorite indie comics called Freaks. Um, and of course, I can't help but see parallels to the Umbrella Academy when you go to power levels, um, specifically the, the one character there who Elliot plays. I can't remember the character's name off the top of my head. Um, I, I think, though, what I think is going to be interesting, though, is do you think, and this is this is a distinct possibility I wouldn't say is true of most other Supers games, do you think this is a game that modern story gamers and, and people who are interested in bleed and emotional responses would like, despite the fact it has Supers? Like, like the Supers thing is kind of the, the, the dressing. Absolutely. I, I think that modern narrative gamers who want that visceral experience want to make themselves uncomfortable uh they want to help understand other perspectives this is a good game for them sure. uh an open group that gets on the same page and takes the safety aspect seriously has the opportunity to have some real experiences here um you know to, to spin some spoons uh right. and if you allow them to it can open your eyes and help inform about the real world around us and, and real things that have happened and are happening around us today all right uh so we talked about how the 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 tie-ins to real life events are there is there like a resource section if someone wanted to know more just wondering if that's something todd put in there like a hey if you are interested in what actually happened in the canadian residential school system he, he here's has, some resources for you he has not that i saw <laughs> um, okay <laughs> unless i missed it i don't believe so um todd todd may have additional information on that elsewhere just wondering. So honestly, that's it. That's, that's all I have about Pandora Total Destruction, a modern narrative story RPG with some powerful messages. Now, what I want to know is, does anyone in the chat room have any questions we haven't covered yet? Uh, they can be directed at a Todd, who, again, is awesome that you joined us. Thank you so much, Todd. Or at Sean, who's read the books. Just one book right now. <laughs> well, the book. Maybe sorry. we'll see. Maybe we'll see more from him on, the, him on this in the future. I'll buy it as soon as there's a starter set and then a box. <laughs> there we go. Comes with Mo the Mo dice. Need, Mo needs a map and dice. Yeah. <laughs> I don't necessarily need it. Well, you know, I like maps, but you know, this is not a game that could come with a map. This, uh, this is not a map game. Uh, just a big, a big whiteboard, like, like with there grid. <laughs> that, a completely board, unnecessary say. grid. Um, but if it has a one inch grid, you can use it for other games too. So put a one inch grid on it. Don't put, put a non -standard, don't put a non-standard grid on it or Mo will get upset. <laughs> So I'm going to read off one comment here from uh, Anchi Games. says, sounds like an amazing and interesting game. I'm super intrigued by it. Just I would eat my tongue if I tried to play it. So not for me. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, this is definitely something. Uh, um, <laughs> Deanna's saying the Pandora box. There's a lot of uh, a lost opportunity there. See? Absolutely. Uh, and Todd is saying that there is no resource. Um, so. Okay, uh, maybe maybe that. I was just wondering, like, like if you want to keep it thinly veiled and not pointed out. I was just thinking, yeah, you know, like if <laughs> someone does play this game and go, you know, are we doing it right? Is this getting the right impact across, or or people really went through this, or any of those questions? I just wonder if there was anything there linking to that. Not saying it necessarily has to be in there. I was just wondering if it was there. As I said, I haven't read it. I will admit, Todd also sent me a PDF copy, but I, I wanted to be the the straight man here <laughs> and hear it from Sean and reply to that. Yeah, I actually, I actually have all the PDF stuff because, again, I did back this at digital. Uh, Todd, mm -hmm. Todd got my money for this one uh, early on. I, I jumped on this one pretty, pretty quickly. I, uh, I think even possibly even before I realized it was Todd's name on it. Um, oh, that's so super you and super RPGs. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah, be surprised. Super Kickstarters uh, hook me right away. So um, uh, I do. I guess I, you know what I did miss from the actual premise of our show tonight, and I said, "Is it or is it not a supers RPG?" I think we did answer. I, I think it is most definitely a supers RPG. Absolutely. Again, there's. Well, I think a lot of people hate the fact that there is no that defined power. You know, yes. I I can shoot a fireball six hexes after mm -hmm. one turn, and if I put an extra three power points into it, I can. That doesn't exist. That no. absolutely doesn't exist. This is much more. Um, again, narrative. 
uh, where you are just sort of paying, you know, I turn into a kaiju. Okay, sure, we'll make that work. And I turn invisible. Yeah. Okay, sure, we'll make that work. I control fire. Okay, sure, we'll but make that work. But how do I know if I could, if I'm stronger than your character? Who cares? Right. <laughs> uh, again, and, and that's and, the argument you're going to get, yeah. right? And again, that, that that's where, you know, <laughs> it... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you say yeah, you shoot a fireball, you put too much power into it, you set the entire building on fire, trapping you and your teammates. This sounds like a real world experience someone might yeah. have had during an actual really play. Possible. Just saying. Well, um, I, I need to get a link of the actual play and put it in the show notes. Yes, we we'll absolutely have that in the show notes. We'll have to, um, I need to grab it ahead of time. Right, you can grab it off. It's on our it's on the uh it's on the, the RPG page, drive through right? drive the oh, drive through. Right? Oh, it's on the drive through page. Okay. Um uh, so yeah, well, you can find it there. All right. It seems like I've uh, already asked everything the chat room wanted to ask. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Todd, for definitely being here to answer questions. And, and Jeff, I hope say. we answered for you that this is, in fact, a hippie story game for you. Oh, yes, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, that, this this sounds pretty hippie story gaming to me. No, no offense to modern narrative gamers such as me <laughs> being silly. All right. Uh, so that's all I have to say about Pandora Total Destruction. Hopefully... I'll be able to get this to the virtual table at some point, and I can let you know how well it actually plays. In the meantime, yeah. what's an RPG that you like that has got layers of reality under its theme? Let us know in the comments. Now, before we move on, I do want to announce a special offer from the man himself, Todd Crapper. He's provided us with a link that you can use to get Pandora in PDF format for only 12 bucks. That's a buck off. All right, so uh, we're going to drop a link in the chat room, and we will be sure to include it in the show notes. For those of you listening at home, you can also use bit.ly slash Pandora Total Destruction, all lowercase, one word. So thank you, Todd, for the discount offer. That's fantastic. Now remember, as the Tabletop Bellhop, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. 